Uh, what was once unthinkable, a direct conflict between the United States and China has now become uh, a discussion, a commonplace discussion in the national security community. A Chinese amphibious invasion of Taiwan might not be the most probable future event, but it's certainly the most dangerous. Our project designed a war game to model a Chinese amphibious invasion of Taiwan in 2026. We ran it 24 times in a wide variety of scenarios. Although Taiwan survived as an autonomous entity, in most scenarios, losses to the United States, Taiwan, Japan, and China uh, were enormous. At today's event, we'll discuss the war game and the insights that arise uh, from it. Uh, with our panelists, we'll also discuss some of the broader issues about um, the uh, U.S.-China conflict, potential conflict, and war gaming. I'd like to note that this event is made possible by a generous grant from Smith Richard Foundation, uh, Smith Richardson Foundation. We appreciate their support. Uh, before we go further, I'm required to make uh, an announcement that in the unlikely event of an emergency, I will give instructions about what we should do. We will either evacuate the building to the front or uh, to the rear. <clears throat> Our event today, we're going to have four parts. Uh, the first part uh, will be a briefing on the report itself that will be provided by uh, Eric Hegenbotham and Matthew Kansian, my two collaborators on the project. Then our panelists will have a few minutes to talk about their perspectives on potential U.S.-China conflict and wargaming. After that, uh, I'll moderate a discussion with the panelists um, um, on particular topics uh, cued by some uh, visuals that we'll put up. And then finally, we'll open the floor to questions, both from the audience uh, here in person and online. So with that, let me briefly introduce my colleagues on uh, the project. Uh, Matthew Kansian uh, currently conducts uh, war games at the U.S. Naval War College. He holds a Ph.D. Uh, in political science from MIT. Before attending MIT, he attended, uh, he earned an MA uh, in law and diplomacy from the Fletcher School and a bachelor's from the University of Virginia. Between these educational experiences, he served as a captain in the U.S. Marine Corps and deployed to Sangin, Afghanistan as a forward observer in 2011. Uh, Eric Hegenbotham is a research, uh, principal research scientist at the uh, Massachusetts Institute for Technology Center for International Studies and a specialist in Asian security issues. Before joining MIT, he uh, was a senior political scientist at the RAND Corporation, uh, where he was the lead author of several uh, major uh, studies, including the U.S.-China uh, military scorecard. He's co-author of a wide variety of analyses on China military power. After graduating from Swarthmore, uh, Eric earned his Ph.D. in political science from MIT. He's fluent in Chinese and Japanese and was a captain in the U.S. Army Reserve. So with that, let me turn the floor over to Matthew and Eric to talk about the report. Thanks very much, Mark. Thanks to our panelists for participating, and thank you all for uh, coming out today. Um, Taiwan uh, looms large in U.S. defense planning, as well as in U.S. grand strategy. In military terms, China is by far the most capable U.S. competitor today. Uh, Beijing claims a Taiwan as an integral part of China, despite the island's uh, long separation from the mainland and its de facto self-governance. And as long as U.S. policy asserts that it might defend uh, Taiwan in the case of attack, that task will be among the most difficult uh, faced by U.S. defense planners. Many factors will determine uh, whether China might use force, not least the political decisions of the various protagonists. But among the most important calculations behind those decisions uh, will be that concerning the military balance of power. Despite this, there's little structured analysis in the public domain about these issues, and this project was really uh, an effort to address that gap. With that as the goal, we created a game that models both uh, ground combat on Taiwan as well as the naval and air war that would stretch much farther afield. The scope and boundaries of the uh, project are important here. The project does not imply that war is inevitable or even necessarily likely, just that it's indeed possible. 
Second, we're not advocating for or against the defense of Taiwan as part of U.S. policy. Our project addresses the likely outcomes of such a conflict and the costs involved. Uh, we do not make claims about the benefits of continued Taiwanese autonomy. That's just beyond the scope of the project. And third, we examine one particular type of conflict, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. We acknowledge that other types of military conflict are entirely possible. China could also employ, for example, blockade or coercive missile attacks, and we encourage others uh, to explore those possibilities. In a sense, this project is about uncertainty. We're discussing an event that might not happen using stochastic models. We therefore experimented with a number of specific uh, variables or variations in the 24 game series. Uh, so for example, we explored the impact of uh, key variables such as how quickly and fully the United States engages in the conflict, the extent of Japanese involvement, and the relative quality and training uh, of, uh, of the various forces engaged. Broadly speaking, we reached two conclusions. First, under most circumstances, China is unlikely to succeed in its op operational objectives uh, or to occupy Taipei. And second, the costs of war would be high for all involved, as Mark said, uh, certainly to include the United States. Uh, starting on the operational piece, uh, the challenges confronting China in an invasion are sev severe. Historically, to subdue forces in a major island campaign, the attacker must transport large formations of soldiers and keep them supplied uh, for weeks and possibly months for the duration of conflict. During the early stages of such a campaign, uh, there's a requirement for specialized amphibious lift to move forces across beaches, though we make allowances uh, for the use of uh, the supplemental use of civilian craft as well. The game highlights both the limited scale of China's amphibious lift capability, despite its growth, and the vulnerability of its invasion fleet to modern air, missile, and submarine attack. To be sure, the Chinese amphibious fleet can land forces. So it does that in 100% of the games that we played. And the amphibious fleet is not without defenses. China is producing large numbers of advanced frigates, destroyers, and cruisers, as well as aircraft carriers. But these ship-based defenses are not sufficient to protect the fleet adequately uh, during the critical first weeks. In most games, the US, Taiwan, and sometimes Japan employ thousands of anti-ship weapons and cause unsustainable attrition to the Chinese amphibious fleet. The game does not assume that China would plan on sustaining the entire invasion uh, through its amphibious fleet alone. The intermediate goal in, in this attack would be to capture China, uh, Taiwanese ports and airports, and then to use a broader range of ships and aircraft, including uh, civilian vessels, to transport troops. In the game, the China team often captures one or more such facilities by the end of the third week. However, those facilities are generally demolished by retreating Taiwanese forces prior to capture or destroyed by U.S. missile strikes in the wake of, uh, uh, in the wake of their capture. And by the time China uh, captures ports and airports, its amphibious fleet is effectively destroyed in most of the games that we played. In other words, uh, China usually achieves too little too late to gain overall success in the operation. Now that is pretty much the end of the good news here. Matt and I are playing good cop, bad cop today, so I will turn the podium over to him to discuss the costs of war, as well as the caveats and conditions that pertain to, to that summary. Thanks. So the positive operational outcome that we believe is most likely that continued Ch Taiwanese autonomy requires four critical conditions. First, Taiwan must resist. If Taiwan capitulates immediately upon invasion, like Denmark or Thailand did in World War II, then there's nothing that the U.S. can do in order to uh, reverse that capitulation. Second, the U.S. must quickly commit its own forces to direct combat operations against China. If there's no U.S. commitment whatsoever, we estimate that it would take about two or three months for China to conquer Taiwan if Taiwan resisted to the best of its abilities, but that that success on China's part is inevitable. There's no Ukraine model for a Taiwan war. We can't simply try to resupply uh, Taiwan and give them weapons during the war because China will be able to intercept any sort of shipment. 
And any delay or hesitance on the U.S. parts only increases both casualties and the chances of China, Chinese success. Third, the U.S. must conduct operations out of its bases in Japan. The U.S. is uh, legally required to consult with Japan before its employment of combat forces. And should that com uh, consultation not result in U.S. forces, particularly tactical aviation operating out of Japan, then the U.S. intervention would not be enough to continue Taiwan's autonomy. Any delay, uh, and finally, the U.S. must have sufficient stockpiles of long-range anti-ship munitions, principally air-launched anti-ship cruise missiles. With thousands of these, it, it becomes a much simpler task, and there will be many fewer U.S. casualties. Furthermore, even a, a successful operation with continued Taiwanese autonomy means that there will be high casualties types of which the U.S. has not seen in intensity since World War II, right? That most of the time uh, aircraft carriers are going to be sunk and hundreds of aircraft will be destroyed on the ground. Bases on Guam are just, uh, generally destroyed on, in the first hours of the war by Chinese intermediate range ballistic missiles. And in all but five of the games, uh, China attacked U.S. bases in Japan, which often brings to, uh, would often bring Japan into the war. So. Throughout the three or four weeks that we model, China continues to attack U.S. aircraft as they arrive in Japan and U.S. ships as they deploy from CONUS, resulting in high levels of attrition to U.S. forces. In terms of human costs, we estimate that around 10,000 casualties or more could be involved, depending on what sort of uh, scenario and assumptions the, the future holds. So these kind of losses in several short weeks raise questions about the impact, about how we should evaluate U.S. Uh, policy and uh, our security posture. To reiterate for this project, we are not arguing against defending Taiwan any more than we are arguing for defending Taiwan, but that the potential costs need to be, of such a defense need to be part of the debate. And our hope is that this project builds on the great work that have been done on previous projects like CNAS's uh, war games on the subject. But it is important for us to look very clearly at these potential costs. As Vegeta said, therefore, whoever desires peace, let him prepare for war. And preparing for these horrible events that we model is the best way to ensure that they never come to reality. With that, I think we'll turn it over to the panelists who will be able to discuss. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> let me turn then to our panelists. I'm going to uh, first uh, start with uh, Dave Diptula, retired Lieutenant General, U.S. Air Force. Uh, he serves now as the Dean of the Mitchell Institute of Aerospace Studies, where he provides a, a wide variety of commentaries and analyses on current national security issues. He served many years in the U.S. Air Force, where he was the principal attack planner for Operation Desert Storm, uh, commander of no-fly zone operations over Iraq in the late uh, 1990s, director of the air campaign over Afghanistan in 2020. 2001, and twice the Joint Task Force Commander. He's a fighter pilot with more than 3,000 flying hours, 400 in combat, including multiple uh, command assignments uh, with the F-15. General Deptula has a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Virginia, and a master in science degree from the uh, National War College. So let me give you the floor. Over to me. Over to you. All right, well first, uh uh, what I'd like to do is give my uh, compliments to uh, uh, Mark and Matthew and Eric and the entire CSIS team for uh, doing this. Um, it, it really provides the opportunity for discussion on a variety of associated topics that are normally, uh, you know, held behind closed doors because of the classified nature of the Department of Defense war games. Uh, so thanks, really, from, uh, I think you've done a great service uh, to uh, uh, the nation for doing this. I'll start right up front by saying I wholeheartedly agree with the four uh, critical conditions for success um, that were just uh, identified and are in the summary report. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to repeat those. But in addition to those, let me uh, share with you some of my key uh, summary observations. Uh, first and foremost, while the majority of the blue teams eventually did prevail in halting the Chinese invasion, uh, as was mentioned, that only occurred after massive attrition on uh, both sides uh, with significant negative strategic consequences for China, Taiwan, and the United States. So my big takeaway here um, right up front is we need to get creative about deterring China from invading Taiwan. Now, 
as most everyone in here understands, deterrence involves inducing sufficient uncertainty regarding success and or consequences in the PRC's mind such that they elect not to invade. So to do so requires taking actions to increase that uncertainty. Uh, and I'll offer an example. Um, assisting Taiwan in acquiring an abundance of surface-to-surface -surface missiles with the range to reach Shanghai and threaten its destruction. The risk of losing their cultural and financial capital would weigh heavily on Xi Jinping and crew. Uh, and so, you, you know, again, it's just an example, but how does one introduce uncertainty of the mind of your adversary such that they wouldn't take the step in the first place? Additionally, I believe it's extraordinarily unwise from a deterrent perspective to yield sanctuary to the PRC in advance of any contact, conflict by declaring that U.S. attacks against China's mainland would be off the table. Um, we should not be self-deterring, and that option should remain in play. Uh, second, and this is outlined in the report too, so it's convenient that we agree, but stealth bombers provide an enormous advantage in this uh, arena. Um, they can be launched from well beyond the area of operations, they carry large payloads, and are the only reusable assets capable of significantly penetrating mainland China to deal with mobile targets. Third, um, it's already been mentioned, uh, again, fully agree that long-range anti-ship missiles are lorazem, plus bombers provide a significant advantage, um, but the stockpile of lorazem, as you'll see in the report, as well as other munitions, both air-to-air -air as well as anti-ship, are currently simply inadequate for any kind of Taiwan contingency. Uh, now, uh, just to put this in perspective, if you go back to Desert Storm timeframe, the air campaign alone consisted of about 40,000 aim points. The kind of scenario we're talking about here, um, you, you could be looking at upward of 100,000 aim points. Now, this is more than just the anti-ship piece, but I just offer that for order of magnitude. Fourth, this has been mentioned as well. While both surface ships and air bases are vulnerable to Chinese missile attacks, airfields are a heck of a lot more resilient. An air base can be back in action in a matter of hours, but with an equivalent attack profile, surface ships will be out of action for months, and uh, perhaps their best role is contributing to the defense of airfields. And certainly that would be the most significant role for the Army in this kind of a conflict, air base defense. Attack submarines, on the other hand, are key assets, and uh, they proved of extraordinary value um, in this series of gains. Now, I do have, I do take issue with one uh, observation in the report that states, quote, produce more cheaper fighters and balance the acquisition of stealth aircraft with the production of non-stealth aircraft, unquote. The statement really ignores the reality of cost per effect. Individual unit cost is absolutely the wrong metric as it says nothing about effectiveness. To put this in context, the unclassified F-35 kill ratios in large-scale exercises are on the order of 25 to 1. Non-stealthy aircraft are not even survivable in these scenarios, uh, so one needs to do an honest cost-effective analysis before defaulting to the cheaper is better assumption to compensate for attrition. There's no value to cheap aircraft if they all get shot down the first day of the war. Um, it's also of significance to note that the cost of a stealthy F-35 is over $30 million a copy less than the unstealthy F-15EX. Finally, the best way to obtain maritime dominance in the Straits of Taiwan is with air power and standoff anti-ship munitions combined with attack submarines. Uh, and to remind the audience, there are over 600 airfields within 2,500 miles of the Taiwan Straits. So while stealthy bombers will be key, so will stealth fighters creatively based across the area of operations. So thanks again for doing this. And uh, the, the report is quite concise, and I encourage all of you to read it. Thanks, Dave. Uh, next, I'm going to ask uh, Becca Wasser uh, to say a few words. She's a senior fellow for the defense program and lead, uh, leads the Wargaming Lab at CNAS, the Center for New American Security. Her research areas include defense strategy, force design, strategic and operational planning, force posture and employment, uh, and wargaming. She's also an adjunct instructor at the School of uh, Foreign Service at Georgetown. 
where she teaches an undergraduate course on wargaming. Before coming to CNAS, Becca was a senior policy analyst at RAND, and previously she was a research analyst at the International Institute for Strategic Studies based jointly in Washington, D.C. and Manama, Bahrain. She holds a master's in foreign service with distinction uh, from the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown and a bachelor's in international global studies from Brandeis. Becca, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and thank you for the reminder that I should probably try and make my bio a little bit shorter for everyone's sake. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about wargaming a US-China conflict over Taiwan and what it is that we can learn from such games. You know, uh, I've run a number of these games myself, both unclassified at the Center for New American Security and also in my previous life at RAND. And so I think, let me take you back a few years ago where my former colleague at RAND, Daybok Manik, made a bit of a splash in the news when he was quoted as saying in war games against Russia and China, the United States gets its ass handed to it. Um, this set off a lot of attention over uh, war games, and in recent years, we've heard about a number of these war games, perhaps more than we normally would. Uh, this includes some of the games that take place behind closed doors at the Department of Defense, as well as a proliferation of unclassified games at organizations like CSIS and CNAS. Um, so why has there been this spate of games? Why are we talking about it in the public domain? And what actually is it that we can learn from these games? Um, I think it's worth noting, wargaming is nothing new. It's not that suddenly we found this tool that we didn't know about before. It's been happening for quite some time, both classified and unclassified. But it has definitely ebbed and flowed in popularity. And one of the reasons why it tends to be quite an effective tool is that it's one of the few that can actually examine human decision making in fictional yet plausible scenarios. And ultimately, decisions about war are made by people. So this allows us to actually look at some of those human decisions that make up how a potential conflict could unfold and the choices within it. Games also provide a safe to fail environment where you can test new strategies, operational concepts, and tactics, right? Um, and I think what we've heard of the most is when these war games have failed in some way. War games are also powerful tools for uh, communicating and socializing information. Uh, they're often used to become a little bit more accessible than, say, a really, you know, word-heavy PowerPoint or even some of the reports that we in think tank land tend to write. It allows people to understand the problem because they are experiencing it themselves. Um, and it's one of the easiest ways to get decision makers on board with understanding a problem as well as what some of the potential fixes to that problem could be. And so when we saw this return to great power competition and conflict and China's growing military modernization, it didn't mean that the US was failing in these war games and that the United States could not actually you know, inflict pain on China. What it did mean is that the United States was not winning as handily as it once did in an earlier era. And so as Chinese military power was growing, it really became harder and harder for the defense strategists um, and you know, military planners playing in these games to come up with different strategies and courses of action that would allow them to have that decisive defeat of China. And so this is why you have so many games that are looking at a Chinese amphibious invasion of Taiwan. Um, you know, as folks have already mentioned, this isn't necessarily saying that the United States, that the Department of Defense would automatically come to Taiwan's defense. Rather, what this represents is the most stressing scenario that US military forces could face in the Indo-Pacific. And because of that, the, the Department of Defense is purposely trying to look at the hardest set of challenges in order to ensure that it can deter effectively and deter at often what is referred to as the gold standard of deterrence or deterrence by denial. Um, and 
you see a number of insights that are emerging from these games. You see this uh, oftentimes with US uh, you know, senior leaders referring to war games for reasons why they've decided to make certain decisions. But you've also seen a number of, war, uh, of insights that have emerged from the war games that have been in the public domain. And these highlight not only the operational problems for the United States, but also the operational problems for China that its military is currently working to overcome. And so this brings me to what it is that we can and should learn from these war games. I think it is so important for you know, all of us to just understand that a war game is never going to tell you the answer. It's never going to tell you exactly which strategy will win the war. It will never tell you which capability will be decisive. What it does do is it sheds light on particular problems that need to be overcome or different uh, courses of action that could seemingly be beneficial as viewed by a particular set of people under a particular set of conditions. And you know we've seen the conditions from the CSAS game being laid out quite clearly by Matt. And so what you have in these war games, it's really just trying to identify how the United States, often along with allies and partners, can stave off a Chinese invasion of Taiwan and defeat China's aggression. But what those actual solutions are, that is space for further analysis by different tools. What we're really trying to do, to General Deptula's point, is we're trying to play out the war, not because we want the war to happen, but because we are trying to ensure that it does not happen. We are trying to identify through war gaming different ways in which the United States can strengthen deterrence and the creative ways that it can work with allies and partners to enhance deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. And so this leads to why I'm so heartened to see CSAS undertake this project um, as it joins some of the work that I've done and folks at other uh, great organizations in the unclassified space looking at this problem set. You know, while these games, you know, the games that CSIS did as well as the games that I've done, there's seemingly different narratives behind them. They adopt different, uh, slightly different war gaming methodologies and different starting conditions, but they seem to be identifying very similar insights and you can see trends across them over, uh, over time. And ultimately, what you need to have in order to produce meaningful policy change, it's more than one game. It's more than one report. It's more than one organization making the case for why deterrence needs to be strengthened in the Indo-Pacific. And so when you look at this broader body of work and what's happening, I think that there's some very clear uh, ways in which you know, we all can collectively push the US Department of Defense to make the smart choices now to enhance deterrence in the long run, to make the smart choices about different posture, about different capabilities, and about different resources that it will need to ensure that the scenarios that we have collectively wargamed will never come to fruition. Thanks, Becca. Um, before we go on to our final panelists, I should note that all of our panelists graciously took time out of their uh, busy schedules to play the game, uh, which we greatly appreciated. And uh, looking out of the audience, I see several other of our uh, participants also, and we appreciate uh, the time you took. Uh, our last uh, panelist uh, is uh, Bill Murray. He's a professor uh, and director of the Halsey Bravo research effort at the United States Naval uh, War College. Halsey Bravo Group is an advanced research program that, example, that examines potential military challenges in the Middle East. In the Navy, uh, Professor Murray served on and qualified to command nuclear-powered submarines. Uh, he served on the operations staff at the uh, U.S. Strategic Command and a member of the faculty at the uh, uh, Naval War College, and he's held a variety of uh, teaching and staff positions there. He holds a bachelor's from, uh, in electrical engineering from the State University of New York and a master's uh, from the U.S. Naval War College. Bill, thank you. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to start off by saying that the, the views I'm about to express are not necessarily those of the United States Navy, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. We are, I think we could all agree that a conflict with China is, would be a, a disaster. We can see what's happening in Ukraine. We can see the difficulties of extracting the, the warring parties apart and, and, and establishing enduring peace. I think those would be those are trivial 
as compared to a similar problem if the United States went to war with China. Therefore, we have to deter this conflict. How the U.S. can prepare for this deter, can best deter against this conflict is a tremendously complex issue. Um, I have another angle on it. I'd like to think about what Taiwan can do to deter this conflict. And in 2008, I wrote an article that you can see on the left-hand side of the screen in the War College Review. And what I advocate in there is that Taiwan should become a porcupine. And what I mean by that is Taiwan should become so difficult to subjugate that it's not worth the effort. Just like a porcupine rarely gets attacked in the wild, so should Taiwan be in the strategic world. And I make a number of recommendations on things that I think Taiwan could do or could buy or could develop on its own or with limited assistance that would facilitate this goal. And they're typically described as things that are asymmetric. And I get challenged. Describe asymmetric, asymmetry to me, so I'll do that. I think what Taiwan needs are things that are small. They need a lot of them. They need to be mobile, and they need to be lethal. And I'll get to that last, last one that I didn't mention yet in a moment. Here's what, I'm, here's what the, ad, the features of small are that are so good. Small is hard to defeat. Small can hide. Small is less expensive. So large weapon systems that stand out against their background are probably not going to survive on a modern war in a modern conflict, or not for very long. So the small is good. Um, the other thing is many. Uh, we buy weapon systems in, in some respects due to by their volume. The bigger they are, the more expensive they become. So small is cheaper. Cheaper is a, is a virtue of itself because that means that Taiwan could buy more of them. And more of them means that they're harder to dig, to, to track down and destroy. So they have a resilience under combat that is extremely advantageous for Taiwan. Mobility is obvious. We see, in, we see in the Ukraine that mobile systems survive and that fixed targets don't. And that's a feature of the modern battlefield. If you don't move, you die. And you die quickly. And by lethal, I think that what Taiwan needs are systems that are lethal. Primarily, they should be lethal against invading ships. Amphibious ships or whatever commercial ships are pressed into service by the People's Liberation Army. They should also be lethal against aircraft. Uh, Taiwan needs to prevent China from achieving air superiority over the island and around the surrounding waters. And I then lastly, I think that lethality has to be applicable to armor. We have also seen that to great effect in the Ukraine. I mentioned this thin line resilient kill chain. All of these systems have to work under modern conditions of combat in which Things that we take for granted on a daily basis will no longer be true. The internet may or may not work. High bandwidth communications may or may not be available. So that what the Taiwan needs are systems that are almost autonomous, that they can see the target and execute against that target reliably. And they ought to be uh, reliably fired or executed by somebody with a high school level of education, something that can be picked up relatively easily. I have some examples of what I think fall into these categories. For those of you who are familiar with weapon system, you'll note that some of these are already in Taiwan and others are from Iran. And why do I pick these? Well, Iran is a nation that feels that it, has, that it suffers from the threat of uh, bombardment or invasion by a vastly superior power. The Iranians are not stupid, they're very smart. And they've come up with a number of systems that although they appear maybe not well thought out. In my opinion, they're very well thought out. So on the upper right-hand side of the screen is an explosive autonomous boat. Um, you can also see that some of the mobile surface-to-air missile systems that Taiwan has, has developed recently, including in the lower left-hand corner, satisfy all the criteria that I laid out on the previous slide. So the Iranians are smart. They figured out some of this. And so, by the way, are the Taiwans. And you can see that the Taiwans have built a um, autonomous unmanned aerial vehicle very, on the upper left-hand corner, which looks very similar to the Shahed 136 in the center of the top, which has been in the news quite a bit lately. Folks, that's the future of warfare. These things are very difficult to defend against. You can, they can be manufactured cheaply. They're extraordinarily lethal. And those are features that Taiwan has to exploit if they're going to survive. And what all of these systems do that I'm showing on this screen is they take advantage of a fundamental nature of physics. What they do is they force the 
larger power to defend a body, and they have to defend against somebody that's shooting bullets at them. And that's a, uh, something that I'm stealing from my friend at work, Craig Kerner. So in a bullets versus bodies competition, the defender has to be absolutely perfect. Anything less than perfection results in death. They're defending a body against bullets. It would make sense to try to put ourselves on the side of that exchange in which we're shooting bullets rather than defending bodies. So that takes me to my last slide, and it's a big so what. Folks, we live in an era of long-range precision strike. And what this means is on a modern battlefield, targets which can't move will die, and they'll die quickly. In order to survive, one needs mobility, numbers, lethality, and ability to blend into backgrounds. If you stick out, you can be detected, and if you're gonna be detected, you can be tracked and then attacked. And modern weapons, as we've, as we've all seen, are extraordinarily lethal. So to survive, we have to hide in, sense from, and shoot from clutter. And I think that what, if we could do this, if we could convince Taiwan that this is absolutely the best way forward, that it would help deter the adversary. And that is truly the, the name of this competition. It's a competition that has to be deterred. And I think that Taiwan could best do that by becoming a porcupine. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. <clears throat> OK, we're going to move to the third part of our uh, session here. I'm going to use some visuals to tee up some questions that arose uh, from the war game. Uh, this first clip. Uh, it's not part of our project, but it illustrates some of the issues that came up in our uh, war game, the Chinese defensive bubble, the ship vulnerability, and the effectiveness of defenses. Uh, the clip animates a U.S.-China conflict in the Western Pacific. Uh, it comes from a larger uh, animation on uh, U.S.-China uh, naval uh, engagement. Uh, prior to this short clip that we're going to see, there's been lots of uh, action between U.S. Uh, fleet units and uh, Chinese aircraft and cruise missiles that has been largely successful up until this point. Um, so why don't we roll this, and I also want to thank Michael Liu, who is the creator of this animation and gave us permission to use it. It is at this point that the Chinese anti-ship assets come into range. The Shandong Carrier Strike Group fires its 32 YJ-18s. These missiles have a trick up their sleeve. At the end of their subsonic sea skimming flight, they have a solid rocket booster which will give them the ability to sprint the last portion of their attack at an extremely high speed. The Yuling Surface Action Group, slightly closer and timed such as the salvos will arrive simultaneously, launches its YJ-83s, a less sophisticated but still potent sea skimming anti-ship missile. As the YJ-83 laden flight of H-6s closes to within missile range, it lets loose a torrent of munitions. All of its YJ-83s are salvoed in rapid succession, side by side with the YJ-18s. At the same time, the carrier strike group begins to fire upon the incoming missiles, but it is simply not enough. Multiple DF-21D warheads traveling at Mach 9 impact the USS Shiloh, the USS Ronald Reagan, the USS Barry, and the USS Curtis Wilbur. While these ships are immensely survivable, multiple hypersonic re-entry vehicles filled with explosives cause too much damage to handle. Despite crews heroically fighting casualties, all vessels give the order to abandon ship shortly after impact. Uh, great. Well, on that uplifting note, uh, uh, let me turn to uh, my panel and ask, ask two questions. First, is it possible for Navy surface ships to operate within this Chinese defensive bubble? Uh, and what, what can we do to make that, um, make that easier or make it uh, possible? Because there's been a lot of uh, discussion, for example, about you know, whether uh, the, the Navy would be able to operate in this, uh, you know, this very uh, um, uh, dangerous environment. So I'm just going to go around our uh, panel here. I'm going to start with Dave. Uh, um. Uh, he, there are not, ab I would suggest, there are not absolutes here. Um, and so uh, the U.S. Navy has uh, thought through these issues uh, and have developed a variety of different defensive mechanisms to be able to operate. The question becomes, uh, given the propensity of examples like we just saw, um, to what degree 
uh, are those defensive measures going to be effective enough or are they going to be effective enough to be able to operate in the kinds of uh, offensive uh, environments uh, that the Chinese are capable of operating. So I'm, I'm not giving you a no they can't or yes they will. Uh, I'm giving you the typical fighter pilot answer of it depends. Um, and it depends on the circumstances, it depends upon the particular ship, it depends upon the number of assets that are launched against these ships. Um, however, um, I believe a broad statement can be made, particularly given the results of our series of games, um, that there's a high degree of probability that it would be very difficult uh, to continue to operate inside the kind of offensive coverage that the People's Republic of China has the capability of imposing. Okay, I'm going to jump to Becca, and then I'll give Bill the last word. Yeah, I mean, I very much agree with the general, uh, where a lot of times in various games, you do see uh, U.S. Navy sur surface ships needing to uh, stay outside of the range, uh, some of the worst threat rings. And so you have them, you know, sort of hanging farther back and playing roles that, to be entirely honest, are not necessarily the roles that the Navy wants to play. Things like air defense and also, uh, you know, considering if we're looking at a broader protracted conflict, you could have Navy, naval service ships playing roles and thing, doing things like critical resupply of Taiwan. Um, but let me sort of flip that and tell you one area where the Navy should be making some greater investments. If you actually look at a lot of the war game series that have been done at DOD and elsewhere, you know, it has become quite clear that undersea capabilities, that happens to be one of the few areas that are a bit more survivable in these types of scenarios and conflicts. Uh, it also happens to be one of the key areas where the United States has an advantage, particularly in quiet submarines. So if you're looking at areas where the Navy should invest, it's possibly more in this undersea domain, both with submarines, but also some of the um, unmanned vessels that can operate and actually have an operational advantage as they start to pick off some of the uh, invasion fleet in the Taiwan Strait. Bill. Somewhere, Admiral Rickover is smiling in gratitude, Rebecca. <laughs> uh, the issue of whether or not... Uh, it's very difficult to execute a successful attack against a surface ship. Um, the adversary has to successfully conduct a number of sequential steps, either sequential and parallel, all of which are very difficult, and all of which could possibly be... Uh, Actions could be taken against these different steps to make the end result ineffective. If the missile misses, it misses. It doesn't matter why it misses. It could be destroyed or seduced or never even get launched. So you have to, you have, it, the, the discussion of whether or not, of how the Navy can operate becomes very complicated and very complex very quickly. And much of that discussion has to remain classified. Um, then the question well, then is, then the, Are there some I've other lost things track. that we could do that, to, make it, could to do. make it uh, the, the surface navy less vulnerable? Sure. Um, if, if you mentioned that submarines are survivable, and one reason that submarines are survivable is because they give very little signature to anybody who's looking for them, but they have an advantage in that they can operate underwater where it's very difficult for sound, to propagate or for electronic signals to penetrate seawater. Surface ships don't have that advantage. They have to operate on the surface of the ship. They are going to have a radar cross-section even if it can be minimized. And to some extent, they're going to have to emit something. All of those things are potentially detectable. It raises the risk of using surface ships in some scenarios. But that's the, that's the role of commanders in the Navy is to evaluate that risk and take steps to minimize it. And that's the art of command. Thanks, Bill. Uh, let me have the second clip here. One of the surprising uh, results of the game uh, was that 90% of Allied aircraft were destroyed on the ground by Chinese missile attacks. 
Uh, one way to reduce vulnerability is to build hardened shelters. Uh, although individual shelters can be attacked, uh, uh, collectively they spread out uh, Chinese uh, missile attacks. Uh, the United States built many uh, during the Cold War, but stopped. Guam, for example, has none. Um, and here we have a picture of some station wagon going into a hardened shelter, uh, uh, but uh, making the point that you know, we did at one point build a lot of these things. So I would just want to ask the more general question about what can we do to increase uh, aircraft survivability, decrease vulnerability. Um, General Deptula mentioned dispersion, and you know, that's clearly uh, one uh, avenue. But let me give you a chance to expand on what we can do to reduce vulnerability. Sure. Um, hard aircraft shelters are, are, are a no-brainer. Um, I am reminded <clears throat> of my efforts back in 2004 to convince the commander of Pacific Air Forces and the Pacific Command at that time to invest in hard aircraft shelters for B-2s and F-22s on Guam that if they had listened, would have been in place by 2008, but here we are in 2023, no hardened aircraft shelters in Guam. Uh, but that's not a complete solution. It does, as you said, Mark, make it extraordinarily, but I don't want to say extraordinarily, significantly more difficult uh, to be able to kill those aircraft on the ground. Um, the second piece I alluded to in my remarks with respect to numbers of air bases, playing a shell game, uh, executing, and the Air Force has done a pretty good job in paying attention and uh, uh, implementing this notion of agile combat employment. Um, that is uh, a way to disperse and operate in a distributed fashion that complicates the adversary's decision calculus and makes it much more difficult for, okay, where do I attack? But that's not an easy solution either. It requires investment in providing the infrastructure, the protection, the munitions, and the fuel, and all done in advance. You can't wait, just like Ukraine. You, well, you can, but uh, the, the outcome's not very good if you wait until the conflict erupts before you invest in these kinds of alternatives. Uh, but uh, there is... Uh, 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 high potential payoff in making those kinds of investments to operate from a dispersed, an increased number of airfields that are dispersed throughout the area. It makes it much more difficult for the adversary force. And oh, by the way, one other piece, back to sort of a universal theme, which by the way, we didn't coordinate any of this ahead of time, uh, but it's the deterrent piece. If you May, if you increase the, the, the confusion or uncertainty is the better term of the adversary that they can, can uh, succeed, then you comp to the degree that they don't attack, that's what deterrence is all about. And by dispersing, uh, increasing their you know, uh, deci uh, uncertainty, their decision calculus, that contributes uh, to deterrence survivability of forces, right? In order for air forces to add to deterrence, to change the, deter the calculus of a would-be adversary, they need to be able to, you know, withstand an attack, to be able to ride it out, survive, and then operate again. And that's part of what I think, you know, the push here is to do. So let me build upon what General Deptula said and talk in practical terms about how we actually do that. And so I think the first thing is if we are looking at um, enhancing some of U.S. posture, if we are looking at doing hardened uh, air shelters and whatnot, what does this require? This requires more investment, investment in posture in the Indo-Pacific. To date, this has been frankly, underwhelming. If you're pointing to decisions that you made years and years ago that haven't come to fruition, well, there's a reason for that, right? There have been, for years, promises to uh, upgrade bases in the Northern Marianas uh, on Tinian, and they haven't happened, right? So there needs to be greater investment, whether that's through the Pacific Deterrence Initiative or, frankly, just through military construction funds to improve the posture um, 
in the Indo-Pacific to have hardened air bases and shelters, and to also start thinking about a mix of active and passive defenses on these bases. I think there's also another piece when it comes down to uh, dispersion and having distributed operations. Right now, the United States has, for example, pretty decent uh, basing and access in Japan but there could always be more. Japan has a number of dispersal bases and civilian airfields that the United States is not currently um, able to use. So entering into discussions with Japan about having uh, contingent use of those air bases would enable some of these distributed operations, but also allow the United States to do things like pre-position critical fuel storage in advance of a potential conflict. There also needs to be expanded access in some areas, thinking a little bit more about whether there's the ability to potentially base aircraft in the Philippines, which can be fairly close in to the first island chain, but also thinking a little bit further afield. Would Australia allow for certain redundancy that would be beneficial because Australia is outside of some of the worst range rings? So ultimately, what you need to do in order to create a resilient and survivable posture in the Indo-Pacific, it requires greater investment as well as enhanced access on top of what the United States already has. Thanks, Becca. Bill, anything you want to add? Uh, rather than repeat what everybody else just said, I think that another, uh, I'm a big advocate of decoys. Every decoy that gets shot at by an adversary just saved a, a just reduced the adversary's inventory of weapons and caused them a frustration of not t attacking what they thought they did. So I think decoys are an, uh, something we can, and Taiwan also can take great advantage of. Great, thank you. Uh, give me the next clip here. It should be number three, the map here. Um, the visual shows the range of fighter attack aircraft uh, in the theater. Uh, this is unrefueled. Uh, it makes the point that range is a severe limitation. Oop, we lost our map. Um, it makes the point that range is a severe limitation uh, in this theater because of the vast distances that are uh, involved. So my question to the panel is, how do we make fighter attack aircraft more relevant given the problems about range uh, and the fact that, uh, going back to the previous point, one of the things we saw was because of the limited range, the United States had to push aircraft very far forward. Uh, we put a lot into Okinawa, for example, and that's one of the reasons that so many were destroyed on the ground because they were now deep inside uh, the Chinese defensive bubble. So how do we what do we do about this, this range problem in the Pacific? Um, well, first, uh, I'd like to remind everyone that we've been operating fighters at ranges of over 1,000 miles for over 30 years now. Um, if you go back to first Gulf War, Desert Storm, uh, you know, our principal stealthy aircraft at the time was the F-117. Uh, it was uh, based at Kamis Mache, which is a thousand miles from Baghdad, one-way trip. Um, we operated routinely during Operation Allied Force from uh, 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 England, bases in England, uh, down to um, uh, the Kosovo area. Uh, nominally, F-15C pilots would operate uh, 10 to 12 hour missions which is the equivalent of a four to 5,000 mile distance. So it, it, these ranges uh, pose significant challenges because they require increased tanker support. Uh, but uh, obviously in the Southwest Pacific, because of the distances, uh, you're gonna have to operate um, with tankers, but it's not inconceivable and it's something that we've routinely done. Uh, so that in conjunction with the uh, uh, air bases, uh, Becca mentioned uh, Philippines, um, and again, I go back to the stats that I cited earlier, there are hundreds of bases that are closer than those ma major, uh, major uh, nodes of uh, Guam and uh, uh, Kadena uh, that can be capitalized upon with a, a bit of uh, uh, innovative thought. 
and uh, concept of operations. Okay, Becca. Uh, there's not much that I can add to that other than just saying I think there also needs to be a recognition that right now the Air Force is not structured to fight in the Indo-Pacific. We are still very much organized uh, for some of the wars that we fought previously, largely in places like the Middle East. Um, and so this is why basing is so important, but I think there also needs to be a recognition that not all aircraft are going to be able to fight from, you know, from range, and that you need to have a better force mix, as well as better consider what munitions might be used by some of these aircraft in order to think about how it is they can both fight close in, as well as from broader standoff range as well. Bill? You'd have to view with some skepticism something a submariner said to amplify what a fighter pilot said, so I'll pass. <laughs> okay. Where does that leave me? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me have number four. Uh, and uh, uh, this shows uh, the location of uh, Chinese, major Chinese units, particularly their uh, air units, and by implication, it's strong air defenses. The team wrestled with the question about strikes against the Chinese homeland. Um, the base case allowed them, uh, but various excursions uh, withheld authorization for those uh, strikes. Uh, stealth, of course, is designed uh, to overfly these kinds of, uh, uh, this kind of terrain. Um, in the game, uh, players very often used uh, 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 air power to strike uh, air bases and ports. Uh, but I want to turn to my panel here and ask the question, where do you think we would be on this question of authorizing strikes against the Chinese mainland? We had, we had a discussion at lunch about this. We had a discussion in the VIP room about this. Um, so let me turn um, to Dave here. I come down pretty hard against, as you heard in my remarks, uh, yielding any kind of sanctuary to the adversary that's the aggressor. I could quickly shift to the Ukraine analogy too, but I won't. I'll limit it to this one. Um, why in God's name would you allow the adversary to take off um, with capabilities uh, that have the potential of significantly reducing our capabilities to accomplish the missions that we came there to, uh, to accomplish in the first place, and that's uh, defend Taiwan. Uh, you know, the case that was made, or not the case, but the conclusion that 90% of our aircraft were defied on the, uh, destroyed on the ground well, that's exactly what we want to do to the adversary. Uh, and China is the aggressor in this case. So I can't make a more logical or strong argument for attacking and destroying adversary military capability before it's able to be employed uh, than, uh, than that, I guess. Uh, I understand the concerns with respect to ex escalation, uh, but I think as is described in your report pretty well, um, there's probably a mid-ground here, and this leads to a larger discussion in terms of how one would actually execute this kind of a scenario. But for the purposes of what we did, it was restricted to defense of Taiwan uh, in the anti-ship element, uh, not going further to threaten infrastructure, leadership, key essential industry, and all the elements that go into achieving strategic effects against an adversary. So uh, it's a long answer, but um, it is imperative if we're gonna win, and at least in the case that we played, had a significant impact by being able to take out Chinese aircraft on the ground before they were able to enter the equation. Becca. It's usually um, something that military planners tend to think about are, you know, a broad range of potential options. Um, and, you know, there's always the old adage where you don't tee up a bad option because that is the option that the senior leader is going to pick. Um, but in this case, I think what you need to have are almost these right and left bounds, right, where you have, um, you know, the potential for a more squeamish national command authority that isn't interested in uh, mainland strikes, perhaps um, thinking a little bit about some of the escalation dynamics. 
um, as well as what would happen if, for example, US territory were struck. Guam is US territory, right? It is not someone else's territory. So if that were to be the case, these are the things that would probably lead senior leaders to rethink their own risk tolerance for mainland strikes. I think it's also worth, you know, sort of putting my wargamer hat back on and thinking a little bit about how players tend to perceive some of these strikes. And I think it's worth noting, at least in uh, the case that I played in, um, the game was focused solely on the operational problem. We were not to be concerned about any of China or US uh, nuclear capabilities. And so that is something that's worth keeping in mind when we consider how mainland strikes uh, would be perceived, uh, both in terms of whether China would perhaps use some of its nuclear capabilities in response to strikes on mainland China, uh, but also in terms of whether knowing that uh, you know, Chinese nuclear response was off the table, whether that emboldened some of the players in the war game to consider strike options that normally they would be a little bit more reserved to have if that were on the table as it would be in real life. Bill. Well, the subject of a conventional strike against a nuclear-powered adversary is without historical precedent, essentially. It hasn't happened, and there's very strong and important reasons for that. I think that any president who found themselves in face with that decision would desperately seek for alternatives. Therefore, folks who do things like I do have an obligation to think extremely carefully about how to come up with options that avoid that. And I'll just hark back to what I said earlier, that um, I think if Taiwan were much more difficult to either bombard into submission or invade and could withstand a blockade, I think it would take that decision a long way, uh, it would remove the ne need for that immediate decision, and I think that would be very desirable. Great, I'm gonna to jump to, my, to number seven, and that's gonna be my last visual here, because I wanna give the audience a chance to do, uh, to answer their questions. Um, the visual here shows Henderson Field on Guadalcanal in 1942. Uh, the Japanese regularly attacked it with air and naval forces, causing many casualties and destroying uh, much equipment on the ground, but the airfield kept operating. Uh, our report describes a high level of U.S. casualties that occurred in a very short period of time, even when U.S. forces were successful. And this will be a shock to the U.S. military, particularly air and naval units, which have operated out of sanctuary uh, for 70 years. Uh, senior leaders in the military are saying the right things, recognizing that a peer conflict will be very different from the kind of conflicts we've fought in the last generation. But whether that has entered the culture uh, is another question, and that's gonna be my, my question to my panelists. What about the military culture that, where we have operated in sanctuary for 25 years and would now be facing a very different kind uh, of war? And I'm gonna give Bill a chance to start this one since uh, uh, you haven't had a chance to start yet. Battles of Guadalcanal show us something important, and it's what happens when you enter into a conflict without having trained properly against what an adversary can do. The Chi excuse me, the Japanese prepared very carefully for the Battle of Guadalcanal, and, and the U.S. Navy paid a terrible price for it. I'd like to avoid that situation in this one. So we have to train hard, and we also have to recognize that for the first time in two or three decades, we're up against an adversary who can't just hurt us, they can hurt us very badly. And they can hurt us very badly if we don't act in ways that are very well carefully thought out. So that's the charge to us, is to avoid that situation. And we're working on it. The whole DOD is focused on this, laser-like. So your, money, your tax dollars are being well spent. Great. Dave? Um, it's a wonderful question. Um, I concur with everything that uh, Bill said. I, I, I have to answer your question, however, that it's difficult. It's difficult, here's one reason. 95% of everyone who's in the active duty military today has come on board after 9-11. They've never experienced a major regional conflict. Last major regional conflict we had was Desert Storm. So, we, the, you know, operating in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Syria, um, we did that with complete uh, control the air and dominance in the environment. Uh, 
very, very different set of circumstances as we've already talked about. So moving the collective institutional perspective from 20 years of recent experience to a future that's more like what we experienced in the opening stages of World War II than it is to the closing stages of Afghanistan and Iraq is a challenge. I do concur that the leadership gets it. The question is that inertial, uh, I'm sorry, institutional inertia, uh, but more, of more concern is do our congressional leadership and the populace of the United States understand the significance of the challenges that are in front of us today? And that, that's a real concern because it takes us down a path that we might have to, uh, if we're not prepared, it's going to take uh, a loss for the nation to wake up. And hopefully we'll have time to correct. Becca. So I'm going to flip your question. And rather than thinking a little bit about whether the military is prepared for this, is the nation prepared to face this. You know, one of the things that I think we've seen a lot in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine is all of a sudden there were a lot of Ukraine flags that I saw, you know, on houses, bumper stickers, you name it. We stand with Ukraine as they have been facing devastating losses and bombardment of their cities. Is the United States ready as a nation to accept losses that would come from, say, a carrier strike group? sunk in at the bottom of the Pacific. We have not had to face losses like that as a nation for quite some time, and it would actually create a broader, I think, societal change that I'm not sure we've totally grappled with, and that in turn feeds into both Congress as well as some of our military preparations. And I'll just end by saying this is the reason why deterrence is so important. This is why we are wargaming. We are trying to find creative ways to ensure that this does not happen, that we do not end up in conflict with China, that China does not believe that its aggression of Taiwan would be profitable. We need to prepare for some of the worst case scenarios in order to effectively deter in the Indo-Pacific, and that requires us making changes now and making the right investments now. And so ultimately, we don't want this, um, which is why you know, I think a lot of our respective research, as well as your games, my games, are really just trying to bring us all to this point of finding new and effective ways to ensure we don't end up in conflict with China. Thank you. Um, I could go on. I have lots of questions that I would like to ask the uh, panel, but I want to give the audience a chance to ask their questions. We have a microphone over here, and then I know we're, um, uh, we have some questions on, uh, online. So, um, okay, let, uh, the gentleman right here was the first one up. Okay, go ahead. You're right there in the red tie or orange tie. This is an excellent study of the, uh, the likelihood of uh, China succeeding in an amphibious landing of Taiwan, and I agree primarily with the conclusions about the amphibious landing. It's very likely to fail. But the study then concludes that Taiwan remains autonomous, which is based on the unexamined assumption that having failed at its amphibious landing, China then stops the fight. My question is, what if it doesn't? If China is not willing to stop fighting at that point, then we're into the second, much longer phase of a Taiwan conflict, oh sorry, thank you, much longer phase where China continues to isolate Taiwan with the goal of eventually st strangling it for long enough that Taiwan is no longer able or willing to resist. And if that happens, then we find ourselves having won the first battle and lost the war despite enormous costs on all sides. So what I would propose is that you model that second, much longer phase of the conflict with equal rigor to what you've applied to the first phase of the conflict. Because it's my assessment, without having done the rigorous analysis that one must do, 
my assessment that Taiwan cannot hold out for nearly as long as China can continue to strangle them and that there's damn all the U.S. forces can do about it and that we will lose that fight unless we radically change our force development concepts and prepare for that second phase of the China-Taiwan war. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Just to give you a, a short answer, I, I, it's a great question. Um, and we're hoping with some follow-on work to look at long wars, uh, you know, what happens if the initial Chinese um, invasion fails, but the war continues, uh, and also at the question of blockade. You know, if, if uh, the Chinese decided to blockade the island, which, which many people believe would be a likely uh, course of action, you know, what would that mean? How long uh, could they hold out? What, how much um, um, you know, supplies would the United States have to uh, get to the island? Great, great question. Uh, all right, I'm going to give t Tony, if I don't let Tony ask a question, he's going to harass me. Okay, one question is, there's a running narrative among Republican lawmakers that arming Taiwan, arming the Ukraine is taking away from Taiwan. Uh, there's been stories about an $18 billion backlog of equipment to Taiwan, including like $9 billion of F-16s and torpedoes and slam ERs. Can you address that narrative? Is that relatively accurate or uh, far-fetched? Let me give you one piece of an answer, and I'm going to turn to my panel for the rest, uh, and maybe my colleagues. On the question of uh, has the support to Ukraine undermined our support for Taiwan, the answer in general is no, because most of what we're sending to Ukraine is for a ground war, and most of what we would send to Taiwan would be for an air and naval war. There are a few places where you have a little overlap, I mean, a little overlap on like harpoon missiles, but the major elements that we've been seeing, things like Bradley fighting vehicles, things like, um, um, what's that? High Mars. High Mars, uh, um, uh, javelins. Uh, I mean, those are not useless in a fight uh, in Taiwan, but they're much less, uh, um, much less important. Uh, on, the, on the question about, um, the second part of your question on the backlog going to Taiwan, I'm gonna look at my panel and see if any of them have some expertise here. And I'm also looking over at Eric, uh, if, well, let me, let, me, let me let Eric have the, the floor here and see if he would like to add. Because that's a different question. These, these are things that have been pending for years. Well, as long as I don't have to answer the question, I'll, I'll, I'll say something. Um, uh, I, I, I would say on this point, uh, you know, it may create some delay or backlog in delivering uh, munitions, but I think the main point I would make about what's happened in Ukraine and the impact on Taiwan is that this sh should be a, an absolute wake-up call for Taiwan. The Taiwanese army is not the Ukrainian army. It is nowhere near as well prepared. As late as about 2010, Taiwan had an active duty army of about 200,000. Today it has an army of about 100,000. Now, if that downsizing had been part of, a, of an extensive modernization effort where they became much more capable, so be it, but that wasn't the case. It was the result of a, um, uh, of a botched transition to an all-volunteer force. So today, uh, you know, there's, it's partly a volunteer force, it's partly a conscript force. The conscripts serve four months in the military. It is not prepared uh, to fight this sort of a war. So I think that would be my main point. In, the, in Ukraine, Ukraine's wake-up call was 2014. Hopefully Taiwan's wake-up call is February uh, 2022. And I'm sorry that I didn't answer the question, but I do think it's an important, uh, important point. Okay, Just quickly to finger. I think you are absolutely right about the fact that if you're looking at what the U.S. military needs in the Indo-Pacific, it is very much air and maritime focused. It's different from Europe, which is predominantly a ground theater. But if you think about what some US allies and partners might need, it becomes a very different question. And that is the case with Taiwan, where it is falling a little bit farther down on the list when it comes down to receiving some of the uh, arms that is purchased through the, for, uh, through the FMS process. And so I think for me, if I am looking at some of these issues, it's a longer it's an issue over the long run, not now. But that means that we have time to address some of the inefficiencies that we have seen and some of the issues that we've seen, particularly in the defense industrial base, which has been waiting for certain demand signals from the US Department of Defense that haven't been given. We need to rethink 
what those are, we need to start thinking more about how the defense industrial base can ramp up for some of the critical supplies, including munitions, that both the United States, the US military would need, as well as some potential allies and partners, uh, particularly Taiwan and others, both in the Indo-Pacific as well as in Europe. So all of that to say is the DIB issues are real, but they can be um, surmountable, but we do need to make steps now in order to overcome them to be able to produce what may be needed. Okay, I, I'm going to take a question off the, from the uh, online audience, and then I'll get back to our group here. It says, what, to what extent did hypersonics play a role in these war games from both the U.S. and China sides, and what impact did they have on the outcome? Uh, I'm going to ask Eric to come up for, in a minute. We did have hypersonics on both sides. Keep in mind that the war game is set in 2026, so the number that the United States has is very limited. Um, and they did have an important effect. One thing uh, that we talk about in the report, though, is that the, the problem about um, um, turning back the Chinese is one of volume. You've got to have lots and lots of missiles, and a handful of extremely capable hypersonics uh, is, not, is not the silver bullet because you just need lots and lots of uh, uh, munitions. Lorazm, we talk about in the uh, report, this is the long range uh, anti service ship missile, particularly when coupled with uh, bombers, very effective and unique, and, but, but used in very large numbers. I know, Eric, do you, anything you want to add on that? On the high, all right, Eric, I'm getting a thumbs up. Okay. Uh, in the audience here, let's see, uh, go ahead. Um, what's happening in Ukraine should be a wake-up call that diplomacy now with China is needed. War is not a game. And this whole concept of war games and people laughing is, is apparent. The costs of war are rampant on people and the planet. The U.S. spent $21 trillion on the war on terror, plus what we've had in Ukraine, and what have we learned? The weapons manufacturers who make a killing off of killing while people starve here and all across the world. Shame. The climate crisis is our common enemy, is, is, not is there, China. Is there a yes. Here? Why isn't the wealthiest country in the world, us, taking Wait, seriously and investing question? the type of money? Yes, right now. Okay. Why aren't we investing this type of money and technology into climate justice and the real common enemy, not China? And we were talking earlier please, please, about. Uh, please. Okay. okay, another que so question. Yeah, all right, right here, a question. I can say, those are fair questions. I read they an are article. far outside the scope of this project. I read Thank an you. article in the Financial Times this morning by the editorial staff that stated that by 2027, uh, China is more likely at the 100-year anniversary of the uh, PRC to uh, try to invade Taiwan. So that gives us maybe four years tops to, to really uh, affect either a change in public opinion in the United States against it or for it and for the uh, U.S. military industrial complex to uh, potentially, you know, build to uh, fight a war with China. Can you comment on uh, whether we have enough time to prepare? Four years, Max. Um, let me turn to my panel for, for their thoughts. The reason we picked 2026 was twofold. I mean, one is that's the end of the Pentagon's planning period, the, the, the five-year defense uh, program. Uh, it's also the, the date that many senior officials have, have cited as the time uh, when uh, this danger becomes particularly uh, important. So for both those reasons, we looked at 2026. Um, but let me, let me turn to my panelists if they have a thought here. No one knows if China would invade Taiwan, and if so, when? There's been a lot of speculation, largely around um, you know, Admiral Davidson's uh, comments about 2027 potentially being the window where China would feel as though it had reached near parity with the U.S. military, and that would provide a potential window for them uh, to perhaps launch an invasion. But ultimately, nobody knows. Even most, I would say, most Chinese military leaders don't know because the decision is ultimately not theirs. 
Um, I do think that because there is uncertainty in the timeline, it does speak for the need to take steps to prepare and to plan now. This includes not only operational planning, but strategic planning, particularly with allies and partners, to think about how these conflicts could potentially unfold and what it might uh, require of them as well. And so all of this to say is there could be a window of opportunity, but we don't necessarily know that. But so we need to take steps now on the off chance that it could be more sudden. But if it tends to be something that's longer term than perhaps the timeline that you've pointed to, what we've done is we've found ways to strengthen deterrence in the Indo-Pacific and ensure that the problem set becomes harder and harder for China so that they would not think to invade Taiwan. Yeah, let me just jump in here real quickly and capitalize on the last part of that. If I understand your question, it was what do we have enough time to make a difference between now and when the, they're most likely? Uh, and it, the short answer is yes. It, if it's investment in the kinds of options that would significantly deter China. Uh, it's a complex, so the next question is, well, what are those? You know, it's, it is not just, a, there is no silver bullet, there is no just military solution, involves the whole diplomatic information, the whole dime, how you doing. Um, and then I would just also add munitions, munitions, munitions of the right sort. Okay, the lady right there has been very patient. Thank you all so much for taking the time today. Uh, my question is on uh, pretty specific. What degree, in your opinion, or according to the game, will China rely on sea mines to target American Navy vessels from stopping the invasion? And would China use minefields sparingly or as a larger method of deterrence? I talk about China or Taiwan or both? Both. Both, okay. I'm gonna let Matthew have a... I think Taiwan would uh, benefit by having the right sorts of t mines and being and demonstrate the ability to deploy them quickly. And I think historically, uh, the record shows that mines are very effective against naval ships if mines can be put in the waters that naval ships will operate. But the Western Pacific's enormously vast. It would take many, many more mines of a different variety than what we've seen China have to really make a difference, depending on how the U.S. operated. The one thing for the for the game um, with the most significant uh, element that we modeled Chinese sea mines as affecting was uh, the U.S. submarine fleet as it became more and more difficult uh, to operate in the Taiwan Straits against the amphibious invasion as China put more and more mines. But this isn't something where uh, China can put 50,000 mines in the ocean in one day. That this is this takes time to make minefields that would be effective, uh, particularly against U.S. capabilities. Okay, I think we have time for one more. I'm going to take it off uh, from our um, virtual audience here. But if you have questions after this, feel free to come on up. You can talk, engage our uh, panelists or my two uh, colleagues here, but we're going to run over and I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, Harl Nolman uh, sends in the question, what size forces do you believe China needs for a forceful entry and occupation of Taiwan? And I'm looking at Eric here, um, and to give him a second here to collect his thoughts, um, one of the Chinese problems was uh, they have a lot of assets. Uh, part of the problem is protecting those assets. So it's not just a question of numbers, it's a question of capabilities also. Eric, anything you want to add here? Yeah, that's a very hard question. Uh, that's one of the variants we didn't really look at. We did do a Ragnarok variant where uh, some catastrophic things went wrong to see sort of what would have to happen with China's anticipated force structure to uh, succeed in its operational aims. Uh, it is hard to say. I will say that, uh, you know, I'll repeat what I said in my opening comments. China's amphibious capability is relatively limited. We projected, you know, further building out to 2026 uh, when we did our orders of battle they could sprint at a rate that's faster than we an anticipated in the study. 2026, of course, is just a few years away, but moving forward, they could sprint in terms of producing additional uh, amphibious craft. And if they can defend those as well as they did in the game, in other words, not perfectly, far from perfectly, but uh, you know, with some success against uh, US cruise missile strikes, uh, 
then they could get a lot more forces ashore, they would have a much better chance of taking uh, uh, ports and airports intact, and then things sort of could potentially snowball from there. So I would say a lot more amphibious lift, a lot more probably uh, stealthy aircraft. They've got a new bomber in the works, a stealthy bomber in the works. That's not, you know, again, in the 2026 time frame, but out, out farther than that. Um, you know, they've already built the surface fleet for it, so I think, you know, improvements in quality, a more amphibious lift, probably more air power, um, you know, all of this is going to make things much more difficult for the United States. I know that's not a, it's far from a definitive answer, but that, those are some thoughts anyway. Okay, thanks, Eric. Well, our time is at an end. I want to thank again our sponsor, Smith Richardson Foundation, for their generous support. Uh, for those physically here, uh, my assistant, uh, Meg Kurosawa. Meg, where are you? There she is in the back. She has a couple of copies of the full report. If you want the uh, full report, you all should have uh, the brochure version. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists for taking the time to join us here. And thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon.